So, uh, I'm proud to introduce Mark Holland. Uh, he's one of BC's leading sustainability planners and thinkers. Uh, he has extensive experience in both the public and private sector. He served in the city of Vancouver both as city planner and as the founder and manager of its sustainability office. He now works extensively with both developers and local governments, moving the sustainable development agenda forward in pragmatic ways. Mark is considered one of the most the more innovative thinkers on sustainable cities of his generation, including being credited with authoring many emerging ideas and frameworks. He has won numerous awards and is known for his ability to make sense of sustainability in a pragmatic way that leads to action. So, Mark Holland. Thank you. It's, uh, you have no idea how much of an honor it was to be asked to do this. I'm a, a pedophile and uh, <laughs> so be part of Ted. Um, I also thank the folks at the back. We don't have the screen up here so I can push buttons so I'll be waiting periodically to move the slide forward. That means it will go a little slower than usual but um, I'll wait into this. Uh, the, 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 the discussion today came out of, so you've got a quick sense of what these three animators up front were here. We had an email exchange that was very similar to this discussion. It was intense. None of the three disagreed or agreed on anything. <laughs> and we, ended up, we ended up with a topic that is, I grabbed a one word that we put on the page called resilience, but I, I can tell you that word doesn't really quite grab what was going on. What I think was cool about that, and I'm not going to do it justice tonight, but I'll, I'll put some ideas on the table to add to the discussion over beer here afterwards, is is it actually speaks a lot to the culture up here, which is an intriguing mix of leaping forward and working together and being reticent about that and distrustful about a lot of weird stuff going on in the world and a desire to be self-reliant, but not in a way that's pissed off and armed, but in a way which believes in maintaining a resilience and a stability and a vibrancy and an artesian quality of, I guess, community, wealth, happiness, etc. So, very interesting kind of dynamic between a trust and a distrust. So, I'll, I try to put some words and some thoughts to it from a bunch of different points of view, and I believe I have roughly 18 minutes, which I probably have to do already, so let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so the big first big question is why bother? Why, why should we care about resilience? This is a slide from a colleague of mine that works at the University of Oregon. And he, he just called it peak everything. So as we're heading forward, I think each of you could probably write a chunk on this. There's a whole range of peaks between oil and population, and food and traffic and vehicles and uh, age, all kinds of interesting stuff. And, and basically the premise is that it's saying that the 20th century and the 21st century are about to begin to part ways. And this is kind of where the next chapter comes from. So the, uh, the story here then is that the rules have changed. The context for the decisions and models we made about our world in the 20th century increasingly no longer apply. So climate is the biggest one that you and me, we are all watching, change the rules of the game, completely change the rules yeah. of the game. Um, water is going to be another one. Food, ultimately, between climate and water, is going to become a very interesting one on top of all the other things we've been doing to our food system, demographics, biodiversity, and all of that is going to start to drive a totally different story of the economy. So the intriguing thing is that the things we used to think that we knew, and that goes for both what we thought was good and what we think is not good, mm -hmm. both of those are now up for grabs. And the only way we're going to move forward is through beginning to adopt this sort of sense of resilience. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so what is resilience? Um, I thought about this for a while, and I don't have a simple definition. This is the one that seemed to hold a bunch of the different ideas. Was And, and I don't really like the word stability, because it, it's a little bit too much close to inertia, I think. But there's a, there, there's a certain quality of not dumping everything out of the boat and having things swim around in the water. So there's a, in the ability, in, in the face of a whole lot of things changing the rules, shifting you around, the ability to be resilient is the ability to move. I remember explaining this when I left government and a lot of people who spend a lot of their life in government, it's one of the biggest fears they have is when someone leaves the government. It's like, how, can you, how are you going to live? How are you going to make money? How is this going to work? And, and thinking about it, I realized that there's, there's different ways of going about life. One says, I don't want the floor to move. So I'm okay if you chain me to a seat 
as long as the floor doesn't move. That's the thing I fear the most. Other people fear being chained to the seat. So go ahead and flip the floor up 45 degrees. As long as I can catch my balance, I'm good. That's all I need is room to move. And that it sets kind of a different scenario, and I think where society is, where we get to go as communities is more with the latter, because the floor is going to start to move. It's no longer going to be stable. So uh, a question here for you, and you each get to find out where you fit on this process, and it's something, to, something maybe to have a conversation about afterwards is, resilience is what? Well, on one end of the continuum, I'm going to say that there's a connected, there's a connected openness. There is an invitation to, I don't know if groupness is the right word, but there's something at that end, which is the ability to respond individually and together. And that's a fairly open, connected model. But the other end of the continuum is essentially this idea of self-sufficiency, which implies an isolation. And everyone is going to fall somewhere there in the middle. And maybe in the middle is a, an abstract word called self-reliant. But these begin to kind of fall on a premise around how you structure your community and how you structure yourself and your community in order to be resilient. Because all of them are arguably resilient, but they're going to play themselves out a little differently. So if we take this isolated version, the most extreme example of this resilience model would be, you know, the, end of the what we jokingly call the Independent Republic of Idaho, where everyone is armed and everyone is a long ways away from each other and they want to keep it that way. And I'm, I'm being maybe rude that way, but... Um, you understand what I'm saying around essentially we're going to wall up and keep people out. And the other one might be more of a, a communal approach where we're going to work together. And any of you who engaged in any of the discussions around the fear of World War III when we were all growing up probably went through some serious thinking about that of when the bomb drops and we're all now suddenly a, a wash, do we embrace our neighbors and get them to help defend our food supply or do we shoot them so that they don't eat our food? This is a very real discussion that went on in many communities across North America, family by family. Where on this continuum do we choose to sit? And that's one of the interesting things that we get nationally, communally, all of these. We, we have to figure out how we're going to move forward.